Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, a discussion of Dr. Uh, Sung Yoon Lee's newly released book, The Sister, uh, North, Korea, uh, North Korea's Kim Yo-jung, The Most Dangerous Woman in the World. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Tom Byrne. I'm the president and CEO of the Korea Society. Uh, today's conversation on uh, North Korean Kim regime will not focus on Kim Jong-un. Instead, in his new book, Dr. Sung Yoon Lee provides an unconventional biography of the despotic leader's sister, Kim Yo-jong. As the mouthpiece of the of North Korea, Kim Jong-un's uh, chief par foreign policy advisor and closest confidant, uh, Dr. Lee argues in The Sister that Kim Yo-jong is in the best position to take over as the leader or first despotess of North Korea should the seat suddenly become vacant. The Sister is not a conventional biography. For starters, basic bio biographical facts are unavailable. North Korea is a closed society where reliable information is next to impossible to obtain. Dr. Lee's workaround and value added uh, is his analysis of official North Korean statements, defector accounts, video re and video recordings of Ms. Ms. Kim's public appearances, and extensive expertise of North Korea. Dr. Lee has produced, as the Wall Street Journal's book review states, a riveting read. The sister is a chilling saga of the family dynasty that continues to oppress the North Korean people. I wonder if Dr. Lee's next book will be titled The Daughter. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Sung Yoon Lee is a fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He has written on the polit politics um, of the Korean Peninsula for numerous publications, including on the opinion pages of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He has testified as an expert witness at the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee hearings on North Korea and has advised senior leaders, including uh, presidents of the United States. Previously, he taught Korean history at Tufts University. Um, <clears throat> and before we delve into Dr. Lee's book, I want to thank uh, the Korea Foundation and our corporate sponsors, the names of which are prominently displayed in the lobby, uh, for making this program possible. We welcome your questions um, live. We will provide an opportunity for in-person attendees to ask questions directly. For our virtual audience, please send your questions throughout the program to policy at koreasociety.org. Uh, the moderator for today's discussion is uh, the Korea Society's Policy Director, Jonathan Corrado. And I forgot to mention one thing. We welcome uh, from West Point the Korean American Relations uh, Group here, and led by uh, uh, Professor Park. So thank you. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today, both in person and virtually. Dr. Sung Yoon Lee, such a pleasure. Congratulations on this book. This is an incredible thank accomplishment. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So let me just give my praise for the book, because uh, I think it is engrossing, page turning, funny and important. It expands our knowledge and complicates our knowledge about the Kim family regime. It's filled with cutting insights and political drama. It's the kind of book that's good for both newcomers and experts. Everyone can learn something from this book. The style, um, so Kim Yo Jung has a certain style, right? And Dr. Sung Yoon Lee also has a certain style. Um, I would call it elegant, extremely readable prose with soaring linguistic flourishes and a wit so sharp that it will cut you if you aren't careful. Now you have made a grown man blush. But thank <laughs> you. Thank you. That's too generous. Thank you. So I can't wait to learn more about this book from the author himself. Um, so let's start with the first question, the most hotly debated topic, which Tom alluded to in his introduction, which is that if something happens tomorrow in North Korea and Kim Jong-un is no longer able to carry his duties on as the leader, you contend that that position would be taken up by Kim Yo-jong. So can you tell us a little bit for why you think that's the case and what kind of leader would she make? Thank you. May I first thank the Korea Society, President Tom Byrne, Jonathan, for this opportunity, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And I would like to especially thank my fabulous literary agent, Barbara Zitwer, who is here. Thank you, Barbara, for taking a chance on me and making this book possible. 
Were Kim Jong-un to exit the political stage this evening, what will happen tomorrow? Is that a fair um, distillation of your question, Jonathan? No one knows for sure, of course, but we can and must speculate. In my view, other than Kim Il-jong, there is simply no contender, no viable candidate who can emerge as the supreme leader of the despotic People's Republic of Korea. Why? Because, yes, we know that North Korea is a male-dominated, brutish, chauvinistic society and culture, and even the notion of a female supreme leader is a bit jarring. It seems even unnatural for that kind of landscape. But what may supersede such cultural, political norms, conventions, and biases, in my humble view, is the central, the irreplaceable importance of the so-called Mount Pekdu bloodline. What is the Mount Pekdu bloodline? As many of us know, Mount Pekdu is a real majestic mountain that straddles the border between North Korea and China. And in Korean mythology, Mount Pekdu is the cradle, the birthplace of the entire Korean civilization, the Korean people. So the Kim family regime, Kim Il-sung, appropriated this Korean myth and the centrality, the central place that Mount Pekdu occupies in the Korean psyche as their own basis of legitimacy. We know that Kim Il-sung as a young man was a small-time anti-Japanese guerrilla fighter working with the Chinese Communist Party and then later joining the Soviet army in the Russian Far East, possibly the most brilliant, successful career move job change ever. By virtue of that affiliation with the Soviet army, he later on was chosen to lead, to emerge as the leader of North Korea by none other than Stalin himself. But Mount Pektu bloodline is the North Korean term to justify and glorify the Kim dynasty, the supposed greatness of Kim Il-sung, the founder, all these qualities which were uh, handed over or passed down well, by blood to the second leader, Kim Jong-il, and now down to the third leader. So it's virtually impossible to think of a non-member, somebody who's not a direct descendant of Kim Il-sung to lead the nation as supreme leader, a Park, or even a Kim with the same last name, but not part of the family. I mean, let me ask you, as a Korea expert, can you think, or if Kim Jong-un died today, can you think of a non-Kim, like Marshall Rhee or somebody taking over? I mean, with all yeah. the cult of personality and you know, statues and photos and pictures and narratives of the supposed greatness of the family. So when you look at the history uh, at the Gopsan faction incident and other attempts to present a challenge to the Kim family leadership, and how vociferously the Kims responded and then reinstitutionalized the entire foundation of the country's legal system, establishing the monolithic ideological system. There's just no one else. There really, since that time, Kim Il-sung did such a good job enshrining that, and then Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un inherited that and have advanced it. But I think you're right. There's, there's no one else. And that leads us to the question of the daughter, which I know that you have um, thoughts about. So I want to bring you there. Oh, thank you. So... Jue, supposedly um, that's the name. We know this from Mr. Dennis Rodman, the former NBA great basketball player who visited Kim Jong-un first time in February 2013. And he held this newborn girl, Jue, and was told her name is Jue, says Mr. Rodman. He may have gotten the pronunciation wrong. I really think it's not Jue for two reasons, one more important than the other. Um, e is the Chinese character for love and is a common character, word used in girls' names in South Korea even today. But it's outdated in North Korea um, for the younger generation, people born after the 1980s. It's exceedingly rare. That is uh, the small factor for consideration. But the more important factor is Kim Jong-il had a stepmother. 
with whom his father had many children. Her name was Kim Song e and Kim Jong il had a very frosty relationship, as mm -hmm. you know, with his stepmother. He hated her. So, would the son of Kim Jong il really name his own daughter, give her that character, love, or heir? I have questions. Chu e might be sort of a pet name, or maybe Mr. Rodman just got it wrong. Um, and Moreover, in the North Korean family tradition, you have this practice of using one character repeatedly to name your children. So Kim Il-sung's sons had Il, Kim Chong Il, Kim Man Il, Kim Pyong Il, Kim Young Il, and so on. Um, so it seems more likely that Chu's name would be something like Chu Un, Chu from mom, Ri Sol Chu, and Un from Kim Jong Un. That's my speculation. Yeah, Sorry yeah. to go off on the tangent, not very important, I know, but kind of interesting to yeah, a North absolutely. Korean nerd, but you know. Um, she's 10 or 11 or 12. When you look at photos of her, she's very cute. Uh, she has had royal training as all you know, royalty princes and princesses do. When you see Kim Yo Jong and Kim Jong Un, at first, Kim Jong-un looked a little nervous when he met Xi Jinping for the first time and also Donald Trump. Mr. Trump is, of course, very comfortable before the cameras. He's a showman, so he pulled Kim Jong-un toward him as if, and then put his hand on his shoulder as if he's the host. And Kim Jong-un, at that moment, looked up at Trump. This is at the first meeting in Singapore, June 12, 2018. And then he recovered, and he did his... Superman tough guy stands. You see, Trump's much taller, so if he looks up, then he looks like the supplicant, not an equal. So at first, Kim Jong-un was just looking at Trump somewhere down his chin, and then he looked up once, and then he recovered himself. Anyway, um, when, you know, at these highly watched summit meetings, neither Kim Jong-un nor Kim Yo-jong looks nervous. And that's because they've had training. Same with this little girl. Why is Kim Jong-un parading her around? I think it's one part psychological manipulation. To project the image of a loving dad, and when you look at them, father and daughter, they love each other. They're very affectionate to each other. It's a happy, holistic you know, image, wholesome image, I mean. So um, Kim Jong-un is trying to tell the world that I'm a family man, and in time, Americans and others may come, come to take the view, look, it's really hard to roll back their nuclear program. He's obviously not crazy. He has a family he loves. Would he really start a nuclear war? Maybe we'll just have to live with a nuclear North Korea. Yeah. I think that's sort of the um, campaign, the yeah. propaganda campaign. Is she fit to be the supreme leader today? I mean, look at her. She's a kid, prepubescent. Right. Yeah. What can a 10-year-old do? Receive a foreign delegation, lead a delegation to a foreign country, issue a statement, give a speech? No. So for the next 10, 15 years, until one of Kim Jong-un's own children comes of age, becomes an adult, uh, in my view, there is simply no one inside, within the Mount Pekdu bloodline, who is a viable candidate. Uh, you stimulated something in me. I was going to ask you about this later, but I, I want to follow up now since it's kind of been brought up. And that's the secrecy around the Kim family. So we don't know really what Kim Jong-un's daughter's name, Kim ju -ae. We don't know that that's her real name. It could be, as you suggested, something We didn't something know else. Kim Jong-un's real name. When he emerged in 2009, the South Korean government kept insisting it's Kim Jong-un, not Un. Mm because Un is more you know, frequently used in a girl's name. So, I mean, the Chinese didn't know either. And yeah. when I look at Chinese reports reference to Kim Yo-jong, they got her name wrong too, yeah. all throughout 2012, 13, 14, 15, And 16. it's not even acknowledged, even though Kim Yo-jong is all over North Korean media, it's not acknowledged in, this, in that media, as you point out in your book, that she is in fact Kim Jong-un's sister. So it's They've probably it. no. widely known throughout North Korea that this, this is the sister. But why not just come out and say it? If it's all about Mount Bektu bloodline, potential successor, why is North Korea playing coy and not just making it explicit? 
it's sort of a family tradition, I suppose. You know, basic biological facts, personal facts, privacy matters. Um, they want to keep within the family, and the people are, the people need to know what they're told only. With the Kim siblings, with the brother and the sister, there's another factor that's quite complicated. It's because their late mother was born in Japan. She was raised in Japan and came to North Korea as a young woman. What's the problem there? Well, that means that her family, parents, indeed, moved from South Korea, from Jeju Island to Japan. And the grandfather, Ko Yong-hee, Kim Jong-un's mom's father, worked in a factory that made military gear and uniform for the Japanese Imperial Army. And in the North Korean insidious, cruel class system, every North Korean at birth is thrust into a political class. Anyone who came from Japan is relegated to the lowest hostile class, so-called. So that's an inconvenient truth that North Korea needs to keep away from the people. And there's another factor. Ko Yong his sister, so Kim Jong Un's aunt, took care of Kim Jong Chol, the eldest child of Kim Jong Il and Ko Yong Hee, and Kim Jong Un and Kim <coughs> Yo Jong when they were living in Switzerland, around 2000. Uh, pardon me, 1996 to about late 2000 or early 2001. Yet, in the middle of it, sometime in 1998, the aunt with her husband and children defected to the United States. And by you know, this insidious penal system of guilt by association, if you are a family member, a relative of somebody who betrayed your country, like a defector, uh, or if you come from Japan, or if you are the children of, or the grandchildren of a Christian, you normally end up in a gulag. And all those three factors, Kim Il-sung went to church. He played the church organ as a child. His parents were Christian. His mother was a deaconess. So that is a big no-no. Yeah. Aunt, mother came from Japan, big negative. And someone in the family defected to the hated, the primary, primary enemy, so-called, the United States. So these complex family matters don't really need to be revealed to the people. Certainly. Um, and when you were speaking before about propaganda used as a means for the Kim family to hide their origins, I was thinking about Kim Il-sung's service in the Soviet army from 40 to 45. He was in the Soviet Union. He would later project himself to be on the vanguard of Soviet fighting against the Japanese in Manchuria and then Korea. He arrived in North Korea wearing his Soviet uniform after the fighting had all been done and told the people in the boat when they landed at Wonsan, I wasn't here. <laughs> this didn't happen that this way. And then he would later in the histories project that he was on the vanguard of the fighting against the Japanese during that time period. Mm -hmm. So, so fundamental to the Kim family narrative is, is all of these deceptions and then making necessary this kind of secrecy. Indeed. And in the North Korean narrative, Kim Il-sung basically single-handedly liberated the Korean Peninsula from Japanese imperial rule. There is no mention of the U.S. role. There is no mention of the Pacific War and the burden that the U.S. bore in bringing Japan to surrender. Um, there is a little bit of reference to the Soviet Union. And with respect to the Korean War, in Kim Il-sung's first biography, there is no mention whatsoever of China's participation in the Korean War. This is in the mid-60s, 1967, 1968, when Sino-North Korea relations were at their absolute nadir low point, the worst ever. Uh, they were shooting at each other. They were calling each other names. Uh, fat aristocrat, the Chinese called Kim Il-sung, mm. which is a big dirty word, um, aristocrat, capitalist. Um, North Koreans were calling Mao deranged old fool, a precursor to the American daughter that would come later for President Trump. So 
uh, because that biography was compiled by a professional writer around that time, there's no mention of China's participation in the Korean War, which was kind of a big <laughs> factor, you know, in the North saving Army North Korea. was utterly crushed, right. utterly destroyed. Um, okay, so I want to get to uh, the feminist discourse around this book, because this is really important, and you talk about it a lot in the book. Um, with the release of Barbie, it is the summer of feminist discourse, uh, especially in countries that don't normally have this kind of discussion. The movie Barbie is going there, and such as the Middle East, and this kind of discussion is happening. So one rebuttal that people typically will take up against the notion that Kim Yo-jong could be the leader is the patriarchal nature of the North Korean system. And yet, at the same time, we see people like Foreign Minister Chae Sun-hee rise up rather quickly. Kim Jue being touted out at ICBM uh, missile launches, directly putting her next to an iconography of North Korea's most powerful weaponry. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, everyday North Korean women are really struggling and subjected to all manner of abuses. So can you kind of tease out some of these dynamics? Because from the outside perspective, it can seem like there's a lot of contradictory things happening right now inside North Korea. Thank you. Um, it's a very complex matter and an important one, of course. I think the emergence of a few powerful women in North Korea is noteworthy. But just that, it does not mean, it does not imply a radical spread of equality. Um, it, 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 so some observers have referred to, as you mentioned, um, a few women like the foreign minister, who's very capable. I think that's why, you know, she's a very capable barbarian handler, American handler. She's been doing it for decades. And she's the stepdaughter of a premier, um, of a former premier. So she's well connected as well, of course, but very capable. And then you have Hyun Song Wol, very prominent. She was on the trip to is on the trip to Russia, um, who has been managing public events for Kim Jong Un for years now. The two had a love affair. You know, this is an established fact. She was Kim Jong Un's former girlfriend. Um, I think that's also a major factor in that she's so close to the family. And then when we saw for the first time um, a pretty young woman next to Kim Jong-un and surmised that must be his wife, a lot of people thought at the time, this is in 2012, that, wow, this must be a sign of something, reform, eventual reform and opening, unlike his father or grandfather, the young new North Korean leader uh, is okay with being seen in public with his pretty stylish wife. They had Disney characters in one concert uh, at the same time in July 2012, played the theme song from Rocky and so on. So maybe this was a sign of opening, you know, an outreach to the United States. I thought it was just personal preference, you know, nothing beyond that. But again, uh, the fact that you have certain public, prominent public female figures surrounding Kim Jong-un, yes, it's to be noted, but does that, is that really an indicator of change, of a willingness to grant greater equality and justice to women? I don't think so. I don't think the evidence is there. Again, you know, the fact that Kim Jong-un lived in Switzerland is to be noted. Yes, it's interesting. But is that an indication of a propensity to reform the nation? I don't think so, because, you know, we go back to Deng Xiaoping, who did lead his nation in a new direction and who did live in Paris uh, as a young man. But then there's a Pol Pot for every Deng Xiaoping. He studied in Paris in his 20s, lived there for four years. Pol Pot did and managed to kill a third of his people, own people. So I think these are rather you know, shallow factors to be noted, but they don't really, they're not really um, reliable indicators of a big shift. With respect to the broader issue of um, the repression of women in North Korea, I mean, they pretend to be an egalitarian communist society, but of course, they're not. They're more an absolutist style monarchy with the power, the technological power of surveillance and repression, 
tyrants, monarchs of the past never could have even dreamed of. The invasion of the private realm by the North Korean state makes North Korea really unique, the, the most totalitarian, the most successful totalitarian, totalitarian state in history. So the women bear the double burden since the famine of the 90s of finding food, finding work, bringing home some money and food, and, and doing all household work as well, yeah. while men lounge around. There are exceptions, of course, but you know that's been the norm over the past three decades. And I don't see any reliable indicators of positive change. Yeah. When you see these smuggled videos of what a North Korean market looks like, it's all women working these stalls and earning the, the vast majority of each household's income. It's, it's what the women are doing. Um, okay, so I, I want to get a sense of Kim Yo-jung's career. Uh, and as you describe well, she had this kind of meteoric rise and has held a number of very high-profile positions on top of the, the PAD, the Propaganda and Agitation Department. She's also held roles um, at the Department of Organization of Guidance uh, and the State Affairs Commission. So can you tell us a little bit about her ascension through the ranks? I've had a morbid infatuation with the subject of my book since December 2011, when I saw a young woman in her early 20s sobbing with genuine pain at her father's wake. Kim Jong-il died all of a sudden in mid-December 2011, and just a few days later, they had his body um, displayed in a glass coffin on a bed of flour and so on for several days for people to come and pay their respects. And when Kim Il-sung died, when Kim Jong-il died, we saw the same scene of people all across the land violently even throwing themselves, beating the floor, the ground in pain, crying, you know, dramatically. I believe much of that is genuine. You were taught how great these leaders were, brainwashed all your life. So some of that, I would say probably over 50% of that is genuine emotion. But there's the factor, other factors, people are always watching you. And if you clap half-heartedly, they might kill you. That was one of the charges made against the uncle that the yeah. Kim siblings had right. killed in 2013, Chang Song Tech. If you're grieving, crying improperly, half-heartedly, they might take you away. So there's that extra element incentive to cry you know, more hysterically. And some people at the wake, you could see they were conscious of cameras. But this young lady wearing the traditional Korean black hanbok morning funeral um, outfit, she didn't care about the cameras, never looked at them. She had her head down like this. She would sob and cry. It seemed as if she'd not eaten in days. Her cheeks were sunken, hollow, and she stood right behind her brother. Hmm. Probably not his wife, I thought. Probably his younger sister. But we never knew that Kim Jong-un had a sister then because North Korea never confirmed it. Um, again, then in 2012, I saw the same lady just doing her thing at a public event, the opening of the renovated Nungla Amusement Park. And Kim Jong-un showed up with his wife. This is in July 2012. And it was a serious, you know, daylight, uh, daytime ceremony. Chang Song Tae was there with his wife, Kim Jong-il's sister. Um, everyone standing at attention, of course, looking all serious at this opening ceremony. But then a young woman, she's laughing and hopping around, hopping over a flower bed. And then she realizes that she's in the camera frame, so she sort of skips away, <laughs> but without any care or fear. And they showed it. They aired that, that clip. <laughs> If she were an ordinary North Korean, she would have been taken away. But not only did they not censor that, they showed it. Why? Because she was in charge yeah. of the propaganda and agitation department. And of course, when she made, when Kim Yo-jong made her international debut by visiting South Korea for the opening ceremony of the Winter Games on February 9th, 2018, the entire South Korean nation was riveted 
waiting to anticipating the first glimpse image of Kim Yo Jong <coughs> once the plane, her brother's plane, touched down at Incheon International Airport around 2 p.m. that day. And when she, when they, when the um, TV stations showed her the first en entrance, stage entrance frame, it was at the VIP reception room. Uh, the nominal head of the delegation, Kim Young Nam, who was 90 years old, had a long and successful career, but by then he was a figurehead. Of course, the real important personage was Kim Yo Jong. And the South Korean hosts led Kim Young Nam into the reception room, and there were reporters waiting inside. And he looked a little out of place, as if he thought he was out of place, and nervous, and looked back to see where the more important person was. And she walked in, erect posture, head up, chin up. Her gaze focused on just two or three spots in the room with a signature smirk smile, not showing any excitement or joy, like I'm so excited, happy to be here. No, like a princess, a trained princess. And of course, the South Koreans had the nominal head of the delegation sit across the table from the head of the South Korean reception party, the unification minister, Kim Young Nam was nervous about sitting there. So he offered the senior seat to Kim Yo Jong, and she graciously said, no, no, you take it. He offered again, and she said like this, you take it. Um, and so many commentators observing that scene said, oh my god, she's so pretty. She's so polite. She's so courteous. They focused on her makeup or lack thereof, um, very simple outfit, no earring, no ring, no necklace, chaste taste in fashion, and so on. We focused, I too, focused on the superficial. But I saw even in that little vignette a very haughty, capable woman. And indeed, later in the day at the opening ceremony, I found the seating arrangement very odd. She and Kim Young Nam were seated already in the VIP box when the head of the host nation, President Moon, Moon Jae-in, made his entry. And Moon's seat was one row below or in front of Kim Yo Jong. So Kim Yo Jong sat behind President Moon, Mrs. Moon, and Vice President Mike Pence and Mrs. Pence and other dignitaries. And when the two shook hands, President Moon had to look up, raise his arm out, while what she did was polite, but not really. Inst she did not bend her torso one bit. She stood with a very nice smile, and, but she did not extend her arm even like this. Her elbow was by her waist. This was it. You're not my equal is the message in that body language. And throughout the ceremony, she sat there with a smirk smile, lording it over Mr. and Mrs. Pence with her chin up, smiling, knowing that the cameras were zooming in on her and conveying the message, I'm the star. You're all watching this because of me. And you'll have to read the book to find out, but I reveal in the book why all of this happened, the seating arrangement and other things. Yeah, uh, definitely buy the book and check it out. Um, <laughs> So despite this, despite her ascension, despite her high profile appearances and an important role in all of this symmetry, Kim Yo-jung still has to walk a real high wire, high wire balancing act. Because what we've learned from uh, Kim Jong-un and his father and his grandfather is that no one's safe, not even family members. There's a number of family members who are six feet underground and not for natural causes, right? So I'm thinking <clears throat> Kim Jong-nam, the half-brother, Jang Song-dek others as well. So how does she manage to maintain her influence, maintain her relevance to the policy process, and also be careful not to overstep her bounds? I think that siblings, the brother and sister, have really a strong bond, that they genuinely really love each other in a brotherly, sisterly kind of way, real genuine affection. I don't know how that bond formed. You know, one can sort of guess that when they lived in Switzerland in relative isolation, uh, due to the nature of their you know family regime, uh, maybe there was an early bond formed there. Mm -hmm. But 
when I look at North Korean video clips, for example, at the Panmunjom summit meeting between Kim Jong-un and President Moon on April 27, 2018, in a North Korean video uh, ahead of the dinner, the banquet, the principals are lined up as guests and receiving guests. So Kim Jong-un, his wife, and President Moon, and his wife, First Lady Kim Jong-suk, Kim Jong-suk, they're all standing together. And the North Korean delegation and more guests, South Korean guests who had not been there earlier, are walking in, shaking hands with the four principals. And when it's Kim Yo-jung's turn to shake hands with her own brother, she can barely contain this laughter. She's about to burst out in laughter. So when Kim Jong-un looks at her to shake his sister's hand, he looks at her and he's smiling. But then she, one just split second gaze at her brother's eyes and then she looks down at his chest and just like, you know, smiles. There was a message there. And I argue maybe the message was, wow, this day is really going swimmingly. <laughs> um, so, and, and many other examples of genuine affection and communication, even at important public events like a summit meeting. So I think, you know, she has the full trust of her brother. Um, at the same time, you know, again, I think she, she's very ambitious, very capable, very calculating. Um, I see her half-heartedly clapping at her brother's events, sometimes not clapping at all, and she's the only one in the room who can get away with that. And that's another indication of the unique, uniquely powerful position that she occupies in the North Korean hierarchy. She has issued over 40 formal written statements since her first on March 3rd, 2020, early in the pandemic era. And I think Kim Jong-un rapidly elevated his sister. It was sort of like taking out a life insurance policy for himself and his young children and his wife. Who better, who can he trust more if something were to happen to him? Yeah. A very capable non-family member? No, his own sister. Yeah as the deputy supreme leader, if you will. So <clears throat> we know that the pandemic can kill both princes and paupers alike. Of course, people of power and means have better access to health care and so on. But we've seen you know, some heads of state um, almost die from COVID. And this is an invisible threat, a mortal threat that the Kim family or Kim Jong-un himself has never experienced before. You know, the North Koreans trump up this fear of an imminent U.S. invasion, U.S. bombing. That's why we need to develop the bomb, so they say. But there has been no such action taken since the armistice of 1953. There has been no popular uprising worthy of the name in North Korea ever, as far as we know. So there's no fear of an internal threat or an external threat. But COVID was different. So in these statements written by Kim Yo-jong, she says repeatedly that her authority is invested in her by ch uh, chairman comrade, her brother, the party and the state. She keeps mentioning that, meaning that she's running her nation's foreign policy towards South Korea and the United States. And of course, there are some major examples of her orders which were carried out, like blowing up the North-South Joint Liaison Tower in Kaesong, uh, built with and maintained entirely with South Korean funds. On June 13th, 2020, she issued a statement that this useless tower will be gone soon. Three days later, it was blown up. On June 4th, the same, uh, the same year, she issued a statement calling on South Korea to pass a law that criminalizes sending leaflets and anything else across the border into North Korea. Four hours later, that statement was issued. The Unification Ministry chief spokesman said, OK, we'll work on it. And other government agencies, including the Blue House, chimed in. And indeed, such a law was passed later in the year, in December. So she has real power. She gets things done. Yeah. And within North Korea itself, again, when I see the senior most officials interacting with her in North Korean videos, they visibly respect and fear her as they do her brother. Yeah. You know, North Korean officials, when they speak at a close range to 
Kim Jong Un at formal events, they cover up their mouth like this. They kneel down, mm. and they don't want to look at him in the eye for more than a split second because in Korean culture, it's considered challenging, you know, for an underling to look at his boss straight in the eye like this. So the same when they look at the sister, they avert their gaze. Visibly, they're uncomfortable and overly, excessively, obsequiously deferential. So, yeah, she occupies a unique position. Yeah. And that decentralization of authority and giving Kim Yo-jong some added ability to make some decision-making on her own is consistent with other things that we've seen Kim Jong-un do. And I'm thinking primarily of the new nuclear law, which gives decentralized authority for others to execute nuclear attacks in the event that anything should happen to Kim Jong-un. So the message is, it's not just my finger on the button and you can't solve the nuclear issue by just getting rid of me. Uh, that, that is now decentralized. So we see that throughout various components of his leadership strategy. Uh, and Kim Yo-jong is, is one of those. Yeah, and if I may, um, a few months before that statement in September last year, on April 3rd last year in 2022, Kim Yo-jong issued her first threat of preemptive nuclear strike on South Korea. Um, she used this as a pretext. The, the then defense minister, when asked the question by a reporter, what if there's an imminent sign of a nuclear tipped missile coming our way? Well, what's our position? The defense minister said, then we'll try to take out you know, the, that missile, shoot right. it down, or shoot right. it, shoot the launch site. It was a hypothetical question. And Kim Yo-jong seized on that opportunity to issue a statement that she had ready, in my view, which is, you know, if, if the enemies fire even a single bullet inside North Korean territory, I will unleash our nuclear forces. That's what she said. She has the authority to do that and bring about something short of total ruin and destruction. And then she reaffirmed that message again two days later in another statement and has made such nuclear threats, yeah. as did her brother, as has her, her brother. Yeah. So um, I think that is an indication that she's saying, telling the world, she too yeah. has her finger on the nuclear yeah. button. And she's had so many important policy statements on, on major developments concerning relations with South Korea and the United States, North Korea's most important relationships to manage. And she seems like she is really moving and guiding policy and making statements that dramatically affect the, those relationships. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about the style of her statements because uh, she is unique in the way that she writes these statements. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Back in 2014 and 2015, many observed a sudden vile shift in North Korean statements, really vituperative, racist, sexist, homophobic, nasty statements. Now, of course, North Korea has long used foul language to refer to US presidents and South Korean presidents, human trash, human scum is a staple phrase North Korea has used, but it was different. It was more colorful, more radical, more aggressive, more dreadful, ugly. For example, referring to the first female president of South Korea, the first elected female leader in East Asia, Park Geun-hye, North Korea repeatedly referred to her as, this is a quote, so pardon me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dirty old prostitute. Stinky Obama pelvis licking dirty old whore. This is from May uh, 2016, but in 2014 it was it was like that. And also in April 2014, referring to Judge Michael Kirby, um, a very respected retired um, judge of the Australian High Court, yeah. who is the principal drafter of a monumental UN report on human rights violations in North Korea who is openly gay, North Korea referred to Judge Kirby as, uh, as a scumbag having a lecherous 40-year career in homosexuality, career in homosexuality. Yeah. And then referred to President Obama in vile racist language, wicked black monkey who should go back to his natural habitat and live off the breadcrumb thrown at it by tourists. I mean, it was just nasty. Really horrible. Yeah. yeah. So I was a bit puzzled why this trifecta, sexism, 
homophobic, homophobia and racism and so on. And then later I realized it's it was her signature, snark. Every statement she's issued in her, under her own name since 2020 has that signature. It's sometimes funny, witty. She, it's very um, focused on her, kind of solipsistic in the first person, like she uses I a lot, mm -hmm. which is very, very rare in North Korean official statements. Uh, for example, in the f very first statement of March 3rd, 2020, referring to President Moon, uh, she, she said, he's a frightened dog, um, has the mental age of a three-year-old, and said, just like somebody, she, and then she referred to another frightened dog at the very end. They say a frightened dog barks more loudly than a dog that is not frightened, just like somebody I know in the Blue House, obviously re referring to the South Korean president. So she's very sarcastic and sometimes very, very potty-mouthed. She's referred to Moon as parrot raised in America, boiled cow head, um, laughing stock, mentally deranged, American lackey, and so on, and many other colorful phrases. She's used the same language against the current South Korean president, President Yoon, and against President Biden, repeatedly called him senile um, back in April and just recently. So this is her you know, signature snark. But then just days ago in Russia, she comes across, she's resuming her well-versed role of the doting sister at her brother's important summit meetings. And she comes across as very elegant and, you know, like a normal person. And here is one of my main points, if I may. By virtue of her identity, a relatively young woman, she's about to turn 36, and her gender, she, and as a powerful person with that identity, She's an unprecedented weapon in North Korea's diplomatic toolkit, I argue. Why? Because of the widespread latent sexism in many of us, may I suggest, in women as well as men, the tendency to patronize, underestimate young women. When she resumes her old role as the charming princess from Pyongyang, and calls for talks with the U US, South Korea, Japan, and beyond, when she says, I want to come to Washington, meet President Biden or his successor, I want to come to UN, you know, New York. I want to, let me visit you again in Seoul. It will be exceedingly hard to turn your back on her because then you would come across as the more petulant party, uninterested in peace and all those good things. And when the meeting takes place, She'll be her charming self again. She'll promise peace and denuclearization and all those good things. And you will want to believe that. And you will want to believe that she's malleable, that you have some control over her because she is a charming young woman. And of course, all the insults will be forgiven. It's much easier to stomach, to accept, to forgive all these insults coming from a photogenic, smiling, young, pretty woman than the less photogenic, portly, surly brother. So, you know, just by her identity, she carries certain characteristics, wit, capability, you know, intelligence. Uh, she is a player. Yeah. So one last question for me, and then I want to get to our audience here. So please get your questions ready. We'll get microphones out to you. Um, so my last question is, what does the future hold for Kim Yo-jong? Let's say, you, you know, putting aside for a moment the prospect of her becoming regent or leader, uh, what do you think is a likely path for her as we look forward to the next decade or so? I don't know, but let me just address your question in this way. If ever Kim Yo-jong is about to be relegated to the role of the regent, whose utility will expire. You know, I estimated Chang Sung-tek, the uncle, to be executed within the first five years of Kim Jong-un's rule. It happened much more quickly, within two years. Um, if she comes to that position, say 15 years from now, 
one of Kim Jong Un's children is the de facto leader, inheritor, successor, or the real leader, let's say. They've depended on the auntie for advice, guidance for a year or two, but now she faces being relegated, you know, marginalized. Will she then remember or not the nipping, wrathful winter of 2013 when she and her brother had their uncle publicly humiliated? branded a traitor, tortured, and killed. According to President Trump, Kim Jong-un told him himself that Kim Jong-un had the uncle beheaded and then had his severed head displayed on the torso in his central office for the delectation of his underlings, for people to see this is what happens if you step out of line. Will Kim Yo-jong remember that incident or not? and be the first to strike. I don't know. Provocative. Um, okay, so we've got a number of questions from our uh, audience that they've sent in beforehand. Susan Zhao from UC San Diego asks, who was Kim Yo-jung's mentor, idol, or inspiration growing up besides her father and grandfather? Um, one must be Kim Ki-nam who was the head of the nominal head of the propaganda and agitation department for decades under Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, and who's sort of the mentor uh, for her, to her in the propaganda agitation department. Um, and I'm sure that there must be many others, but you know, again, you can form a bond, have a mentor whom you genuinely admire and respect as a prince or princess, but in the end, it's not a conventional mentor pupil relationship, right, right. You're, you're in a different class. Yeah. Um, so she went to school. She went to, you describe how they created a whole special class for her. And one of the goals was for her to perhaps meet a husband there. Right. What do we know? Does she have a husband, kids? Does she have her own family? I don't know. Um, it's never been confirmed by North Korea. When she visited South Korea, she reportedly told her South Korean interlocutors that she's married, has a child, and is even pregnant, but that can't be confirmed, you see. Interesting. Uh, any audience members? Yeah, I see Sean King has a question here. We'll get a microphone out to you. Just a moment. Okay. First of all, Barbie flopped in South Korea. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Lee, I'm only a few chapters in, so forgive me if this comes later. How did Kim Yo-jung fare after the debacle in Hanoi? Was there any punishment because she was part of the delegation, however symbolic or superficial that may have been? Thank you. This is a spoiler alert, I suppose, <laughs> but um, the summit meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un in Vietnam in February 2019 did not end well. President Trump was distracted. He had his personal problems to deal with his former lawyer was testifying in Congress against President Trump. So he stayed up most of the night before the summit meeting the next morning, watching it on TV. So Trump was less patient than he may have been. And when the two sides couldn't reach an agreement, Trump said, okay, I gotta, I gotta go and left Kim Jong-un there as a tourist for the next couple of days. Um, so Kim Jong-un was, displeased, and he had his entire retinue, except for his sister, punished on the ride home. How? They had, they had their arms, they had to raise their arms like this. It's a traditional way of punishing naughty children, you know, for a minute or two, kneel in a corner, but this happened for the entire duration, 70 hours. Kim Yo-jong, of course, was not. So, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, she's, of course, things could change, but there is no indication that Kim Yo-jong is not untouchable. She is untouchable. So it was evident that Kim Jong-un frustrated from his closest advisors not giving good advice, going in with the expectation that Trump is going to go for this deal, this uh, less than full denuclearization deal, 
uh, and then surprised afterward and, and punished his closest advisors. Of course, the great leader is infallible. He can never do anything wrong. So when things go awry, they punish others, scapegoats. Yeah. And um, this is the single, I believe, that Hanoi summit was the single greatest public humiliation he's ever endured, yeah. experienced in life. Yeah. A uh, question from Alex Shikov from IDA. So first from all the Fletcher alumni community, thank you for everything you've done for the school. Question, what was the most difficult part about writing a book about such an unlikable character? You spent a long time with Kim Yo-jung, not personally, but, you know, interacting with her. So what was that like? Well, quite frankly, lack of accessibility. This is, of course, an unauthorized, um, undiplomatic <laughs> biography. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there were hurdles, uh, and that's true of North Korean studies in general, of course. The um, difficulty in not only ascertaining, gleaning facts, but confirming facts, it's a, it's a hurdle. Um, I had a lot of help along the way, superb research assistants who helped me, who looked at every single reference to Kim Yo-jong in China, on the mainland, also in Taiwan, um, um, of course, you know, I looked at every single reference in North Korea, as well as in South Korean reports and so on. And I watched again, you know, hundreds of hours of video, North Korean video, which was quite helpful, actually. So, yeah, there are some, you know, limitations. Um, but it was, yeah, I, I also learned a lot uh, during this whole exercise. Michael Ralston from the U.S. government asks if um, Kim Yo-jung would ever be a threat to her own brother. In the foreseeable future, I don't think so. Because I don't know if the people will be able to accept that. If she has her own brother eliminated just to become the, the supreme leader, um, that's very different from you know, her emergence with the full support of her brother. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very different reality. Perhaps a more likely scenario could involve uh, a question of succession with one of the younger children uh, being tapped for leadership but not quite ready, her as regent reluctant to give up the reins and then trying to inspire some uh, support behind her bid. Well, I mean, she knows that, you know, avunculicide, I looked up the word, it's a real word, <laughs> killing your uncle, nepoticide, <laughs> killing your nephew, and so on. These are the staples of the North Korean dynasty. So uh, if she feels threatened, either she will try to escape or eliminate the threat. That would be the rational decision. Yeah. So she could follow in her aunt's footsteps and try to come here to the United States. I think she's too arrogant, too haughty to do that. But who knows? Um, any more <clears> questions <throat> from our audience? Yeah, we got one in the front here. Thank you. We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. My question is, Kim, Kim Jong-un recently took his train to meet Putin. Now, that's fantastic global politics because the entire world was watching in horror. Do you feel Kim Yo-jong is, is influencing her brother in this um, move by North Korea to um, overture uh, Russia? And also, um, I mean, it's obvious implication with China. I mean, is she, is she involved in all that? I believe so. Um, a few weeks before the Singapore summit, first summit with President Trump, Kim Jong-un flew to China. He had visited in late March, met with Xi Jinping, and was treated to a super banquet featuring a $200,000 $200, bottle of Mao Tai Zhou, um, Chinese hard liquor. <laughs> And he flew back, he, uh, he, that's the only time he did not take his train to China, but he flew to Dalian in the northeastern part of China and met with President and Mrs. Xi over two days with his sister, not with his wife. And why? Because they wanted, Xi and Kim wanted to be on the same page on the eve of an unprecedented you know, summit meeting between North Korea and the United States. So China, of course, is observing Putin's meet, meeting with Kim very keenly and will be extra motivated not to fall behind and invite Kim Jong-un back to China. The last visit took place in January 2019. Is Kim Yo-jong involved in this? I would think so. 
because she has been since her first um, sojourn abroad in, a, in an official capacity in coming to South Korea in 2018. I see the summit meeting, of course, you know, we know that both sides want something from the other. North Korea wants help with advanced military technology, satellites, ICBMs, submarine, nuclear powered submarines, and so on, and Putin wants ammunition and so on. But more than that, I see this meeting as a prelude to geostrategic shift in the region, meaning new relations, new summit meetings, um, new policies to emerge. And North Korea is the driver here. Kim Jong-un is the driver here. What I mean is, you know, despite the conventional view that North Korea is crazy or merely reactive or just, you know, um, response to what America does or says, they have agency. They don't just go berserk and escalate endlessly. They know when to climb down the ladder of escalation and with a smile propose talks. And others always answer the call, often coming with you know, bundles of gifts, money, food, fuel, and so on. So going back to uh, the era of Kim Il-sung. So um, meeting with Putin now gives China an extra incentive to invite him back. Other nations will follow. And Kim Il-jong will be the face of this charm offensive, a post-provocation peace ploy. So um, yeah, the Kim-Putin summit, uh, the optics were, you know, the body language between the two men were much happier than their first meeting in Vladivostok in April 2019. Kim Jong-un looked kind of disheveled, exiting his Mercedes sedan. Putin, uncharacteristically, was not only punctual, but early. He was standing there waiting for Kim Jong-un. When Kim Jong-un exited, and that's the only time he did not bring his sister on this foreign visit, um, he, his mouth, signature mouth suit was all you know, creased, and uh, the back of his jacket was bent up like this revealing, can I say, say this on air, the, the contours of his you know, backside. And um, no one, of course, on the retina could have like, laid their hand anywhere on him, the supreme leader, except for his sister. You know, no one could have like, touched any part of his clothes, especially in the vicinity of his dirty hair. So just when he needed his sister, he, she wasn't there. But on this trip, the sister's there. She resumed her old role, brought the pen for her brother to sign the guest book and so on. And she was just watching with a very charming smile, happily. Um, yeah, so I believe she's very much involved in her government's policy making. Let's get to one last question. We'll, we'll have a microphone for you. Oh, okay. um, do you think that this Russia China, North Korea, <clears throat> and bringing other countries in the world together is a response to the Japanese, South Korean, U.S. summit and the U.S. effort in Asia with Japan, with South Korea, Australia, it, it, you know, which happened and I think that was so historic certainly, and now we have this, so it seems that the world is splitting up into the good and the bad, <laughs> if you will, yes. but do you think it's a result or this was planned or, I don't know, could you talk about that and the future of the division, how it might be emerging? Sure, good question. So, since um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February last year, We've returned to the old Cold War dynamics of Moscow, Beijing, Pyongyang on one side, confronting the other you know, side, Team USA, flanked by America's allies, South Korea and Japan. There are differences, of course, but the basic two camps, either you're with us or with them, that kind of we versus they mentality and reality have returned. So yes, what the other team does incentivizes the other to take actions of their own. 
sure. But again, North Korea invaded South Korea first. North Korea has been the aggressive party. North Korea has killed thousands of South Koreans since 1953. North Korea has launched attacks by land, by air, by submarines. South Korea has been more reactive, as has the United States. But because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, now the traditional allies, Beijing and Pyongyang, have a broader room to do what they desire, which is to launch ICBMs to be more aggressive in the Taiwan Strait and so on. So we're living in a very new, dangerous world. And when we refer to these six nations, we are talking about six of the world's most powerful militaries. By all indices of measuring military power, North Korea is up there. Of course, China is in the top 10. North Korea is in the world's top 10, the US, Japan. We don't talk about it, but Japan has a world-class navy. Japan is a major military power, although J Japanese troops have not been in combat in decades. So there, this is very concerning to us, what Putin and Kim seem to be doing, you know, agreeing to military cooperation collusion is of concern to the United States. And that's one reason, because instilling fear and concern in the other side, other camp, brings dividends to North Korea. That is, they always return to talks when North Korea calls for talks. Because of that reality, I think, the next time North Korea says, let's talk, let's meet, talk about peace and good things, Kim Yo-jong's role will be all the greater because she's done it before in 2018, sort of setting the stage for um, Summitry, pageantry, handshakes, and bonhomie, and all those good things that usually bring far greater benefits to the North Korean regime than the bigger powers. Thank awesome. you. Um, I'd invite you to come to our program next Thursday at 10 a.m. We're discussing new nuclear dynamics of Northeast Asia, and we're going to get into a lot of these types of issues. So please join us for that as well. Please help me to thank and congratulate. Professor Sung Yun Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We've got some dumplings in the kitchen. Please stay, chat, have some lunch. And our West Point cadets, we're going to meet in the boardroom in just about five, 10 minutes. So you have some time to just relax and start eating your lunch. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>